Um, hi, Daniela. Can you unmute yourself? Can you hear me? Yep, very well. Yeah, how are you? I'm well, thank you. How are you, Ranjeev? Um, I'm good, Daniela. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, it's, it's always great to have you. Um, we've been talking about the issue of plastic pollution for uh, so long, and you're one of the you know pioneers in you know trying to address this uh, issue, and also one of the most positive people that I've met. Where you know when we're talking about these issues, which are really global, it just feels like it's such a huge challenge, and it just feels like you know we're just you know one or two individuals around the world. Actually, never mind. It's not one or two individuals around the world, but sometimes it might feel like uh, you know there aren't enough people. Uh, you know, they are creating change. So, but you're one of the people who, like, is always trying to, um, you know, create something positive and, you know, address the solution. And um, I believe Think Beyond Plastic is one such, you know, amazing platforms for really accelerating change um, towards better systems. So, could you tell us a little bit about what you're doing with Think Beyond Plastic and how it's um, structured? Who, who are your key, key stakeholders? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. And congratulations on building an amazing platform for conversation. I think uh, it's been a long journey for you as well and for WasteWise. And you've done really, really well allowing people to touch on top subject and speakers that they wouldn't ordinarily be able to. So um, you're, you're providing a great service to the community. And I hope that everybody who listens considers that. And I'm going to put in a pitch for you and supports the nonprofit because it's tough to what you're doing. Um, about Think Beyond Plastic, uh, we are positive. We come from a background of business and entrepreneurship and innovation, and we look at these major global challenges as an innovation opportunity. The reality is every time there is a challenge of that nature, which is characterized with uh, huge distribution, impact on many people, complexity, and penetration in society, it gives an opportunity for a massive shift, a massive change. And if you look at the world of plastic, it has essentially not changed uh, for the last 50 years. Sure, we have now plastics that are used in more ways than before. They're different color. They, we, have, we have tampered with, with their marketing properties and with their economic properties. But in reality, nobody has ever innovated around creating plastics that have a relatively short end of life or do not leach toxic chemicals or actually are created uh, materials that are created that have similar properties but are not fossil fuel based plastic so it is an industry that is ripe for innovation and in fact uh, the product plastics as a product represent the crossover of two industries it's uh, it's the plastics industry and the chemicals industry each of them are about 700 billion dollars so there is, from an innovator opportunity, there is a tremendous economic um, goal there, the tremendous amount of money involved, the price is great, and the barriers to entry are also very high. So when we first started Think Beyond Plastic, we launched it with the intention of capturing uh, human ingenuity and innovative spirit and firmly believing that if only we were to set a stake in the ground and say, this is a problem worth solving, come innovators and entrepreneurs, that this would, this would address the issue. And that was probably naive and arrogant Silicon Valley thinking. That was in 2013 when you and I first spoke. Uh, over the years, we realized that just giving money to entrepreneurs and identifying winners of competitions is not enough. There are hundreds of competitions around the world right now, and many of them have very good and noble goals in mind. But the reality is these innovators need much more than just being acknowledged and given no matter how much money at the, at the end of the competition. Um, what in, in particular in this space, what they truly need is guidance from industry, who represents one of the biggest customers right now, of price performance characteristics that these solutions need to meet. Um, they also need access to innovation infrastructure. And that is actually very, very important, probably more important than anything else, because in a university lab or in a research lab, you can develop 50 grams of material. It's not so hard. Um, what becomes difficult is crossing the value of death after that, which is taking these 50 grams of material 
and trying to figure out how do you make a product out of it? What does it look like? What properties does it have? Do you have the capacity to manufacture to scale? And that's um, the journey between the 50 grams of material and the minimum viable prototype. It's tougher than you think. And uh, in many instances, that type of equipment exists only in university labs. So if you're an entrepreneur wanting to break out on your own and take that technology, even if you're able to pride off the hands of technology transfer offices in universities and pay the price, um, it's still hard because you need to get access to that equipment. And uh, oftentimes accelerators give it in exchange for equity of your company, which doesn't exist yet or other times there are um, major uh, corporations that offer access to their own facilities, but then of course, this is not a pre-competitive environment. So we came to realize that creating this infrastructure for testing, characterization, developing products, uh, testing end of life, uh, chemical leaching, you know, all of the components, as well as being able to build for commercial scalability and tests for this needs to be created. And so uh, Think Beyond Plastic incorporated in its second year and third uh, access to facilities and lab spaces where these innovations can be tested. We are now uh, opening and expanding into a facility, a network of facilities around the globe because um, these facilities need to be close to where entrepreneurs are. So we have one in North America in, in California but we have entrepreneurs and entrepreneur networks and hubs in Indonesia, in Africa, uh, in Europe, in Southern Europe, and all of them need access to these facilities. It's unreasonable to expect that they'll fly across three continents to come and test it in one place. So the facilities need to be near them. And in addition to that, um, many of these uh, user facilities develop different capabilities based on what the entrepreneurs in that area most likely are wanting to test. So it's fascinating to be able to provide this. And then the third constituency we work with, so we work with industry, we work with entrepreneurs, is investors. Because mm -hmm. uh, none of these ideas would flourish had there not been uh, access to capital. And the investors are a broad category. It's not just private capital, it's uh, government, it's non-dilutive investment. Um, there are some impact investment funds that recently got created. And the challenge for investors right now is um, how do you know what's a good investment in that space? Investors in general don't like chemicals and new materials all that much. It's risky and the investment horizons are long. So um, we are working with those who are willing, we're creating new business models where there is a combination of public and private capital to fund these early stage innovations. Or um, some of the big investment funds are creating an arm that funds through grants and non-dilutive capital, early stage innovation around the areas that we talk about. New materials, green chemistry, uh, product delivery, and so on and so forth. So. Uh, Think Beyond Plastic has grown to be able to deliver the services that are much needed to industry investors and innovators. Let me just remind you that uh, we have Daniela Russo with us. Um, she's the founder uh, and CEO of uh, uh, Think Beyond Plastic. And my name is Ranjit Anipu. I'm a senior uh, waste management consultant and I'm also a co founder of Be Waste Wise. And uh, since 2013, uh, Be Waste Wise has uh, been helping people around the world who are looking for solutions to get in touch with people who, who to connect with people who can provide those solutions. And uh, Daniela um, has um, created a platform, as she was explaining, which actually provides solutions, uh, who, which actually provides support um, to people who can provide solutions to, to the world. Daniela, um, uh, when you were talking, I was thinking about uh, one aspect, which is uh, that why aren't, uh, innovators in plastics and you know chemicals why aren't they able to compete with other business ideas and you know regular in uh, accelerators why do they need a separate accelerator um, because developing solutions for the plastic space is unlike anything else it's actually fairly complex and um, our uh, accelerator arose out of need 
the need was that um, these entrepreneurs need special uh, equipment to be able to develop their solutions. It's very much like biotech and the biotech space. If you look at the biotech space about 10 years ago or so, the solutions required um, major capital investment in terms of equipment and innovation development that only exists in research labs and academia. If you want to branch out of this and start your own business, then you need access to multi-million dollar equipment, and it's very difficult to gain that access. Um, it's, uh, some, it's only offered, as I said, in academia under very complex conditions or by innovation labs uh, and research centers owned by industry. So creating this um, innovation ecosystem foundational support is essential. In addition to this, plastics are not just one thing. Uh, plastic products are a combination of materials, chemicals, product design, and then on the other hand, you have all of the recycling complexities associated with introducing a new material into a system that's already inefficient and, and incapable of spreading fast as it is. So uh, we have uh, encountered multiple problems for our entrepreneurs along the way. And so we've created this space, uh, this innovation center that will give them access to state of the art knowledge, research, data, but also needs by industry. What industry needs has to be best described in terms of price performance characteristics. So they need um, a product or material that has certain economic properties, but also certain performance characteristics. And uh, that doesn't exist readily out there. It's not um, like creating... Can, can you talk about that with an example of a company that you've helped or an innovator that you've helped? Well, I mean, there are many. Uh, if you look at our website, you will see we have innovators developing um, the next uh, generation product packaging. Uh, so take Pulpworks, for example. Pulpworks was one of the very first companies we worked with, and um, they create packaging out of cardboard. But it's not just ordinary cardboard. It's cardboard that is pressed and processed in a particular way, similar to ecologic brands um, who now just announced um, a packaging solution for L'Oreal. So both of these companies have been uh, around for a while. They've been perfecting their product, but what was essential for them is to develop an understanding of what it is that their customer needs in terms of aesthetics, um, in terms of uh, performance. Um, sometimes the packaging needs to be moisture resistant, needs to have water impermeability. We're talking about um, solutions that need to last on the shelf for a certain period of time. The company we work with uh, right now at the Accelerator, EvoWare, out of Indonesia, is developing film out of uh, algae. Um, there are multiple applications for film like this. For both companies like Unilever and companies like Lush, they have different requirements. They have different characteristics. So it is essential that industry communicates with entrepreneurs on that level. Um, it is essential that entrepreneurs are able to deliver on these characteristics by having the equipment that they can try and test. And that is that is the niche that we fill. That is the, the important component of the valley of death that we fill. Um, right. And um, this is something that we spoke earlier, which is, um, uh, you know, learning across boundaries, uh, which also means that, um, you know, there are different um, situations and different requirements and different regions of the world. Um, so could you talk to us about what you're seeing in when it comes to innovation in you know materials, um, new materials um, and plastics alternatives um, or new product designs? Um, can you tell us a little bit about the trends that you're seeing worldwide if they're different from one another, if they're similar? Well, the, 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 the first point I should make is that everything around developing plastics or uh, materials in that space is about interdisciplinary teams. There is no question about it. When you develop a new material or a new coating, you have to start thinking about what will give the commercial properties to that material you are developing. And so if you have a new material that might be biobenign, that might be derived out of cellulose or naturally existing bacteria, then um, that's just the first step. The second step really is how do you make a product out of it? And 
what are the uh, components and the compounds that you need to add to this material so you can have a commercially viable product. And if you have biobenign material, but conventional endocrine disrupting chemical that you use as a compound, then you've really achieved nothing. So what we have observed, which is fascinating, is that innovation in one space necessarily brings innovation around the entire value chain. So even if you start with new materials, then you have to focus on green chemistry and sustainable chemistry for inks and dyes and additives. And then there is an innovation around delivering product. So um, there is a whole uh, portfolio of innovations in the area of delivering product without packaging and minimizing packaging altogether, delivering product as a service. And then if you really focus on these new materials and new chemicals, uh, how do you recycle this? What are the recycling implications? And um, there is, again, a whole host of innovations around sorting and tracers and markers and being able to accommodate different recycling streams and create derived value out of this. So I, uh, we, you and I talked about this. I don't necessarily know that um, different geographies have different innovations, but at the same time, we are noticing interest in reprocessing agricultural waste in, say, southern Europe, uh, as well as in South America, where there is plentiful and abundant agricultural waste rich in cellulose. In uh, Indonesia and the Philippines, there is an interest on uh, what grows in the sea, seaweed, algae, and how that can be repurposed, because there is a whole industry of people well-equipped to process, harvest, and, and then th the learning there is how you make a material out of this. So it's about new job creation. Um, on, in places in uh, Europe, Northern Europe and Canada, there is a lot of interest in chemi chemistry and green chemistry. And so we work with a whole consortium of green chemists from Germany, um, and we're beginning relationship with uh, science from uh, Canada on uh, developing uh, sustainable organic green chemistry additives. So it is, it is a global challenge, it is a global problem, and I think um, what is particularly fascinating is to see the innovations that arrive from different parts of the world. In Africa, for example, we have a lot of innovations around recycling and, uh, and in places in uh, Central and South America where there is an abundance, and, and India as well, when there is an abundance of relatively more affordable labor and um, the, the cost structure is different. So there is an opportunity to leverage that create job opportunities in repurposing uh, plastic. It's not our favorite one, but it is an opportunity to minimize waste. And uh, we are very pragmatic in, in the solutions that we identify and develop, because in the end, it's all about minimizing the plastic footprint of our consumption. Great. Um, I think India needs innovation and making sure there are no power cuts when it rains. Absolutely. <laughs> um, but, uh, but no, there, there is a huge potential for innovation in all kinds of, um, you know, all walks of life and not yeah. um, in, in the world. And um, I think research and technology, especially applied research, is one of those um, activities which really moves us forward in leaps and bounds. Um, so I'm really excited about, you know, what Think Beyond Plastic is able to do. And um, talking about acceleration, um, I wanted to talk to you about pace of change. This is a yeah. question that, you know, we generally um, ask quite, you know, talk quite a bit about. Um, so what does the next five years look like to Think Beyond Plastic or to um, the society uh, uh, and to the innovators? Um, that are part of Think Beyond Plastic. How, how does that look? What's the success rate of the innovators? Could you talk about that? Well, we, if we had to step back and ask ourselves what our greatest goal is in doing what we do, it is to accelerate the pace of discovery. We truly stand at the beginning of an avalanche of innovations um, in new materials, in chemistry, in how they come together, in this whole new packaging alternative, but not just in uh, the packaging world. Um, there is a, a whole circle of innovations in agriculture, which has a tremendously high plastic footprint, healthcare, uh, transportation, construction, 
and um, the innovation opportunities there might be different and have a different value but nonetheless it adds up to reducing our plastic footprint as a society so we are excited about all of that we believe that um, if we can contribute to creating a very viral innovation ecosystem uh, that would look like um, thousands of innovators coming and competing with each other um, some succeed some will fail the failure is par for the course and the first movers will be replaced by second and third generation companies we're very much at the beginning of all of this with the first movers and we see business models perfected changed some of the companies we worked with about uh, four years ago are now beginning to get serious traction serious funding and um, great awareness by industry and the public so I do see that um, the shift that we're engineering uh, will be supported by major changes in policy. We are working very hard to create a global innovation fund that will be a combination of public and private capital. And that will allow entrepreneurs to apply and receive seed funding for their ideas that, that have a measurable impact on plastic pollution that will unlock a lot of interest because of course it's not all about the money but it definitely helps to get you off the ground uh, so in the next five years we will see a thriving ecosystem of innovations we will see a more steady flow of innovation uh, we will see innovations in green chemistry for sure because that's already happening and uh, we will see a steady flow of capital in in all of these it will not be venture capital it will be a combination of public and private money uh, but it will also be global and so uh, there would be a lot of changes I also think um, some of the major brands are already considering and assessing these transitions we talk to many of them and we know that um, what is in the way of it right now is the process that is taking place in testing experimentation and cost and some of that cost will need to be offset by governments because um, innovation is expensive and uh, so when you deal with a publicly owned company who is largely responsible to their shareholders for um, their, their economic benefit it is impossible to imagine that uh, the shareholders would easily swallow a drop in the company's performance in exchange for um, just kind of a better, um, more um, environmentally friendly packaging solution. Packaging is something companies don't like to even consider paying for because it's just, it's how you get the product. It's not, nobody sells you a bottle, people sell you the liquid that's inside it. So um, there would be a lot of change in that space. I think we're already seeing some investments, but I also think uh, we will see, we're on a tipping point of major announcements coming up and uh, uh, great innovative solutions that will be really game changers one that excites us the most um, I think beyond plastic is the implication of delivering product without packaging on multiple levels uh, refillables is one of course but that's just kind of the obvious one but being able to deliver um, a branded product a product that not just wholesale but a product that carries a marketing brand in a different delivery mechanism that minimizes packaging and changes how shelves are organized in a department store or in a grocery store. Um, being able to communicate to the consumer that marketing information and uh, establish a one-on-one -on -one marketing with them, that is definitely going to be a game changer. And uh, we've been nibbling at it uh, with like refillable bottles and installations of machines and. Uh, Coca-Cola is trying to do that as well in certain locations but it's going to be much bigger than that it's going to involve luxury brands and it's going to involve branded products cosmetics um, you know uh, things like this that you wouldn't ordinarily think of as uh, something delivered to you without packaging and that is fantastic um, so uh, something uh, uh, that's really awesome I, I really love to hear more about um, you know details about that kind of innovation which, um, if you might think, I mean, just a few years ago, actually, e even now, it's not considered part of um, managing waste or uh, managing plastics, but then all of a sudden you have all these different kinds of 
um, fields which are impacting how how you do these um, yeah. you know, same things. Um, just so I, I would really love to hear more about it. But um, just um, so could could you talk about that? Could you give us some more insight about it? Um, well. Um, as I said, there has been a lot of experimentation of what we can do without packaging. No so, question about it. Let me um, uh, rephrase that question then. Yeah, yeah. Um, are there any examples that um, you, you're working with right now? Um, are any um, companies that you're working with right now that... There, there are, and there is much more than what I can share publicly, but there are two companies at the Accelerator right now one from um, Chile and one from uh, uh, from um, the Czech Republic. And both of them work uh, in a different way, a different implementation of a model of delivering product without packaging. Right now it is delivering dry product goods to people um, who bring their own reusable container. And in North America we already have that experience in some of the upscale grocery stores like Whole Foods. But the reality is um, that can be a product delivery mechanism for people who are economically disadvantaged. And um, the company from Chile, whose name is El Gramo, has determined that uh, they can save up to 20% of the cost of goods delivering to people if they use that method. Um, there are a couple of other companies that, uh, we, uh, that are on our horizon that actually deliver detergent, um, liquid detergent and cleaning um, detergents uh, through a refillable station in front of a store. So you can, you can bring your material and get that detergent there. Now there, uh, there is one major brand we work with, and I, I cannot disclose who that is, who is looking into delivering uh, more of an upscale product uh, without packaging to consumers who go into their stores. And so the, the really fascinating piece of it is that you would be able to go and receive marketing information, ingredients, and the data that you're supposed to get about every product um, just beam to your phone. And if you do that, um, that, that adds value to the, cost, to the company as well because now you establish a more direct communication with a consumer, including your purchasing habits and your um, the time of purchase and all the details about you that usually are not available when you're in the store and you just grab something from the shelf. So when companies start thinking about this, it revolutionizes their entire business model, marketing model, and how you deliver marketing information. And that, as I said, will open multiple opportunities in, uh, in software, in hardware delivery systems. So it will start with just delivering one service, but it will bring ripple effect throughout the entire ecosystem of um, uh, elements that deliver this service. Right, right. And um, speaking about uh, um, ecosystems, I mean, um, we see a lot of collaboration happening now across, you know, different um, stakeholders. And uh, one very interesting um, collaboration, a trend that all of us are observing right now is um, um, large consumer product uh, companies, uh, packaging companies becoming involved in, you know, managing waste, which is, you know, generally not something that you know we would associate them with um so um, how can that uh, such companies who might have a challenge uh, that they need to overcome how, how how can they work with um think beyond plastic um how do you um incorporate their needs into um your um acceleration of uh, innovation and discovery Thank well we know. already work with many large companies and uh the nature of that relationship is very special to us because um, these companies are, many of them, are committed to transitioning towards a circular economy for plastics and minimizing their waste footprint. And in order to do this, things need to change. Clearly, you cannot uh, achieve that goal without changing how you do things today. And the engine for this change is innovation. Now, um, many of these major brands have internal R&D departments. They do research development and have a lot of scientists. Uh, what they don't have is um, the capacity to take risk because they're all risk averse and also the access to innovators in all stages that we do. So uh, Think Beyond Plastic uh, accelerates the pace of discovery for, for these brands, but also is able to, understanding what their needs are, 
create a solution that combines product, uh, material design, and chemistry in many instances and present it to them. So um, when it comes to waste, uh, we work with some of the major recyclers in the world to understand what the challenges would be for bringing in a completely new uh, generation of material into that recycling stream. Because, um, of course, one great uh, concept which is advanced by Bill McDonough, and he loves it when we talk about this, is what if the product packaging that we use uh, it actually integrates into the environment easily and breaks down into its natural ingredients? It is, it is great and it is possible in some instances, but in others it is not possible. So uh, for situations where the packaging cannot break down to its natural uh, ingredients, it will have to be recycled. And if that is the case, then how does that work with existing recycling streams? What innovation needs to be created there to increase, or maybe business models to increase collection, to incentivize collection, and um, to accommodate for these new materials? This is an area that's open for uh, innovation. and. Uh, there is a lot of interest uh, in it in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, in India, in places where um, traditional infrastructure is either insufficient or lacking. So we have an opportunity to leapfrog and uh, create something completely new, connected to new materials. Awesome, that's great. Um, friends, so uh, we're um, coming towards the end of the session, um, just three minutes to go. Um, and I just want to um, remind you that um, this is our um, this 2018 global dialogue on waste was possible due to um, you know the the time that was generally spent by all our contributors. So thank you very much to all of them, and um, thanks to you, Daniela. And um, it was also possible because of um, the effort, um, uh, the volunteer efforts uh, that were put in uh, into this. Um, so um, thanks to all our volunteers. And also to um, Shweta Dandapani, who's our online community builder, um, who's been, you know, uh, managing some of the chats and who's been, you know, uh, coordinating a lot of our social media online. So thanks to everyone. And uh, um, and I just wanted to say that um, waste and many of the environmental challenges that we're facing these days um, um, for our generation, um, all the living generations right now are global, but the solutions are local. Um, and it doesn't always have to be local. Sometimes there could be global coordination, national coordination, regional coordination. But again, um, it just uh, needs a lot of collaboration and a lot of collective action from um, all parts of the society. And for something like that to happen, we require um, scalable knowledge dissemination um, solutions like Be Waste Wise, and which is why we're really passionate about what we do. You know being able to do something like this with so such less inputs, uh, but also be able to create um, such a huge impact um, o o over a really long time time period. So um, if you are an organization who has access to expertise and who are looking for ways to engage with more audience, you know, get in touch with us and let's work together. Um, and uh, if you are um, uh, industry or industry group, or if you are um, investor or innovator, get in touch with Daniela Russo. Um, um, so yeah, with that, I would like to end the conversation. But before we end, uh, Daniela, do you have any um, final remarks um, or anything that you would like to remind the audience about? No, I, I think that for everyone who uh, is interested in the topic of plastic pollution, remember that it's not a problem, it's an opportunity. And uh, if you want to look into what the opportunity looks like, do talk to us and take a look at our innovators, uh, thinkbeyondplastic.com. All right, great. Thank you so much, Daniela. And thanks, thanks so much, Daniela. guys, for um, joining us today and uh, for your patience. Um, you'll see an um, uh, edited version of um, this event, and we'll make it seem as if nothing happened um, and everything went smooth. So. Uh, thank you so much. Have a good day, uh, good evening, and uh, good morning. I'll have a good night. Um, so thank, thank you. So much. See you, Daniel. Bye. Thank you. Bye.